Thanks, Ted, for those kind, generous words. Sounds like an interesting guy. I'd like to meet him sometime. Okay, we are gathered here to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the birth of William Gaddis. As it happens, 2022 could be regarded as the 40th anniversary of the birth of Gaddis studies, as it's now called. Unlike some modern authors like Salinger, Pynchon, Gaddis was slow to attract critical attention. As most of you know, the recognitions was panned upon its appearance in 1955, but for the next 20 years, hardly, anything, hardly anyone wrote about it. It's true that in 1962, the pseudonymous Jack Green attacked Gaddis' reviewers in Fire of the Bastards, but that was just a mimeographed publication with very limited distribution. The first academic essay didn't appear until 1965, but it was one in which, as Gaddis later quipped, quote, the recognition's debt to Ulysses was established in such minute detail, I was doubtful of my own firm recollection of never having read Ulysses, end quote. The author was Joyce scholar Bernard Bensock. He was a friend of Dave, novelist David Markson, who later told me that the original essay was mostly on Gaddis, but that the journal's editor told him that since Gaddis was unknown, he would publish it only if Benstock emphasized the Joyce angle. Uh, the first dissertation on Gaddis appeared in 1971, and that same year, David Madden and Tony Tanner included chapters on Gaddis in their well-regarded books. After the publication of J.R. in 1975, a few more dissertations and articles followed, leading up to two key publications 40 years ago today, this year. The Review of Contemporary Fiction devoted a special issue to Gaddis, consisting of a half dozen essays and an interview with him. And that same summer, 1982, my Reader's Guide to the Recognitions appeared. It says here, hold for applause, but oh. nothing. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you missed your cue. I don't want pity applause. <laughs> okay, after that, the earlier trickle of Gaddis criticism became a river. In 1983, there was the first MLA session devoted to his work, followed by a second book on him in 1984, and the 1985 publication of his third novel received major review coverage. Two more books on Gaddis were published in the 1980s, three more in the 1990s, as well as a steady stream of journal articles, chapters and books, and dissertations, which has continued to this day. Gaddis also has a strong online presence. In the year 2000, Victoria Harding launched the Gaddis Annotations website. And in recent years, digital discussions of Gaddis across a number of platforms have perhaps exceeded print publications. However, I feel there are a number of aspects of Gaddis's work that have been neglected, which I would like to see younger Gaddis scholars tackle someday. My writing days are over, so I'll leave it to others to pursue these topics. I'll admit up front that these suggestions reek of traditional scholarship. They have little to do with the concerns of literary theory as practiced over the last 40 years and are almost diametrically opposed to some more recent critical activity, which I'll address at the end. What follows are simply the kinds of things I personally would like to read. So, this wish list falls into three categories. Influences, Gaddis's relation to traditional fiction, and potential uses of the Gaddis archives here at Olin Library. Okay, influences. For years, the question of influence, perilous word, Gaddis called it, has been answered rather carelessly, both regarding non-existent influences on him, like Joyce, and his questionable influence on others, like Pintion. Meanwhile, many of the real demonstrable influences on Gaddis have yet to be addressed. First and foremost is the influence of the 19th century Russian novelists. So many of Gaddis' attitudes and techniques were shaped by those novelists that they are vital to an understanding of his view of the role of fiction and of his goals as a writer. Evidence of their influence can be found in actual quotations and references to Russian lit in Gaddis' texts, as well as in his letters and interviews. Of special use would be William Gass's account to, of his and Gaddis' trip to Russia in 1985 in his essay entitled Gaddis Gets Read To, which is in his Temple of Texts. A, a book you should all buy if you don't already own it. It's a wonderful book. Where he writes, quote, for him, Dostoevsky was as near to God as nature got, unquote. And then adds, quote, Gaddis' love for the Russian novel and for the predictable Russians at that had surprised me. And then he goes on to name some of the similarities between their work and Gaddis's. Topics to be in explored include stylistic influences, Gogol's ideal of saving Russia, the role of money in Dostoevsky, especially in counter counterfeiting in the double, 
Yass's love of Gocharov's Oblomov, which he often said was his favorite novel, the black humor in Gogol and Dostoevsky, which of course anticipates by a century the black humor of the 1960s, and other topics. For example, Gaddis quotes the idiot in the recognitions, and the following quotation from a recent book by Olga Solovia suggests one reason why. Quote, Prince Mishkin spends his conscious life copying a manuscript transmitted from Russian, the Russian elders. In his examination for employment as a copyist, he re reproduces the signature of the 16th century Russian saint Pavnuty Borovsky so exactly that in the course of copying, he comes to identify with the saint and his words, end quote. Now this obviously parallels Wyatt's identification with Flemish painters, especially the crucial moment of adding a signature, which is when it becomes a forgery, which Wyatt broods on. Fun fact, Gaddis disliked the idea of readings and refused to give them, with one exception. Asked to give a reading for a special event in 1991, he read a comic chapter from Dostoevsky's Demons. I feel an entire book or dissertation could be devoted to Gaddis and Russian literature. Granted, that's a lot of reading, but it would be worth it. Okay, two, influence of earlier writers who, unlike Joyce, actually did influence Gaddis. Mark Twain among the Americans, Gustave Flaubert among the French, and British authors such as E.M. Forster, Evelyn Waugh, Joseph Conrad, especially Conrad, Ronald Furbank, Frederick Rolfe. As with the Russians, he quotes all of them in his work, refers to them in letters and interviews, and noted in one letter that Waugh's handful of dust inspired Carpenter's Gothic. Three, influence of undernoticed nonfiction books like Oswald Spengler's Decline of the West and Arnold Toynbee's A Study of History. The latter had an especially profound effect on Gaddis in his 20s, and he later said that reading Spengler, when young, permanently altered his outlook on life. If you're a Gaddis specialist, you'd certainly want to know what he meant by that. I'll confess I've only browsed through both books, deciding to leave the heavy lifting to someone else. Number four. Plato rhymes with tomato, as Thomas Eigens says in J.R. Gaddis' writings and letters are filled with references to Plato's dialogues, but an essay examining all this needs, still needs to be written. He disliked Plato's contempt for the creative artist in the Republic, but wrestled with his idea of justice and on the question of how a good person should conduct him or herself in a corrupt society. Virtually all of his references are noted on the Gaddis Annotations website, but someone needs to piece them all together to answer why Gaddis was obsessed with the Greek philosopher all his life. And in fact, such an essay may be underway, as I'll explain at the end. Faust, number five. We still need an essay tracing the importance of Faust to Gaddis. Some critics have mentioned it, of course, and they're, but they've only skimmed the surface. Faust obviously plays a role in the recognitions, which started off as a parody of it, but there's a need to explore the Faust references in J.R. via Schramm's Western, uh, Gaddis' Dirty Tricks, and a, as Ali told us earlier, uh, how important Faust is to that screenplay. Uh, a frolic of his own also. In a 1998 letter, 1988 letter, Gaddis compares Judge Kreese's law clerk to Faust's assistant, Wagner. Gaddis cites both Marlowe's Dr. Faust's and Goethe's version. Uh, Dostoevsky cites the latter, so those two could be tied together. Gaddis even owned a signed copy of George Hameson's The Bedside Faust, which apparently is a graphic novel version. Faust was also important in the nonfiction Gaddis was reading when he was composing the recognitions. He is especially, Faust is especially prominent in Spengler's book, and to a lesser extent in Toynbee. The Faust figure was big in post-war fiction. Thomas Mann's novel, Dr. Faustus, came out in 1947 and was treated in one early dissertation on Gaddis. And Faustian man, quote unquote, via Spengler, was a recurring topic among the beats. The subtitle to Jack Kerouac's novel, Dr. Sachs, written in the early 50s, is Faust Part Three, all of which could be brought in to widen the scope of a paper. Gaddis had a perhaps unique take on the subject. In a 1973 letter, he confessed to, quote, a preoccupation with the Faust legend as pivotal posing the question, what is worth doing, end quote. That question might be the unifying theme in all of Gaddis's work. All of his novels can be regarded as dramatized responses to that question. So you can see the potential there. Six, uh, and regarding Gaddis's influence on others, how much in common does he actually have with post-war novelists? 
He's often grouped with, like Barth, Coover, Gass, McElroy, Pynchon. I would say less than imagined, but it's worth detailing. Useful here would be the Gaddison Fiction page on the Gaddis Annotations website. I find it extraordinary that Gaddis has been depicted or mentioned in so many works of fiction. Of how many other post-war novelists can it be said? Which strikes me as a worthy topic for an essay in itself. Uh, seven, we need a closer look at Gaddis's library, which is posted online somewhere or used to be. Some are just books sent to him over the years, but a careful sifting is needed for influences, inspiration, parallels, sources. I've been dipping into it for years, but I sense there are a lot of potential discoveries waiting there. For example, his library included five books on witchcraft, which is five more than most people own. As you know, witchcraft is one of the many occult topics mentioned in the recognitions, but Gaddis acquired three of these after that novel came out, which indicates a continued interest in the topic. You may also recall that there are several references to witches in J.R., all by way of Gibbs and Stella, which is otherwise free from occult elements. So what's up with that? Why the enduring interest in witchcraft, of all things? That's just one example of many topics suggested by the library. Okay, B, traditional themes. For all their modernistic features, Gaddis's novels have much more in common with traditional fiction, and in fact, he regarded himself as a traditional novelist. While working on a frolic of his own, Gaddis wrote to Gregory Combs to say, quote, while I frequently enough see my work cited in a postmodern context, I cower in the notion of a traditional novelist to such a degree that, sitting back and looking at this work in hand, I'm often enough depressed at the notion that it will be dismissed as behind the times. So, regarding JR, set aside for a moment systems theory, entropy, capitalism, information theory, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and examine it as an old-fashioned realistic novel dealing with troubled individuals. Witness the marital discord between Eigen and his wife, and the emotional confrontations between Gibbs and Marion, child visitation rights, Rhoda's conflict near the end with Eigen, Bast's backstory with Stella, and reference to, quote, that summer in Tannersville, unquote. Workplace interactions, dysfunctional families, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all rendered with kitchen sink realism. Note how in J.R. Gaddis withholds many secrets in the Bast family, gradually revealing them as in a conventional suspense novel. Like good mainstream fiction, the novel pulsates with raw emotions brought to a boil by various conflicts. And the same goes for Carpenter's Gothic and A Frolic of His Own. These are character-driven novels as much as they are idea-driven. How people interact with each other, how they conduct themselves during times of stress, and the moral standards they live by are just as important to Gaddis as the intellectual matters, if not more so. One of Gaddis's sources for information theory and cybernetics in JR was Norbert Wiener's The Human Use of Human Beings, and that's where Gaddis's focus is on, the effect of such common concepts on actual human beings, living actual lives. JR is not simply about the abuses of capitalism, but how people react differently to such abuses, whether they tolerate them, fight against them, contribute to them. That is, their personal choices, which comes down to character, which won't be, impaired, won't be apparent unless you pay as much attention to Gaddis's methods of characterization as to his intellectual concerns. For example, there's an episode in JR, uh, about page 190 or so, 200, where Jack Gibbs is in a phone booth in, Pe in Penn Station talking to Thomas Eigen, when he spots his heartthrob, Amy Joubert, joyously coming in his direction with outstretched arms, and for a moment he thinks it's for him, then watches as she rushes by to embrace her son, Francis, who has just arrived. Gibbs says to Eigen, quote, imagine having her, having anybody that glad to see you? Ugh. In that single line, which may be the saddest in the entire novel, Gaddis reveals Gibbs' lifetime of loneliness, lovelessness, and alienation. The novel is filled with these lightning flashes of characterization, which brings all of his characters to life in a manner more often seen in fine conventional fiction rather than in the ultra-literary sort that he's associated with. Same with his other novels. They are all more traditional than they are given credit for, which is one reason why Gaddis always felt uneasy with being identified with postmodernists post like Barth, Bartolome, Coover, Gass, Pinchion, and the rest. Many characters in their fiction tend to be flat, even cartoonish, whereas Gaddis always tried to create round characters, as E.M. Forster called them. And Gaddis was a very close student of his aspects of the novel. And what's more amazing is he does so from J.R. onwards solely by way of dialogue. As you know, there are no 
there's no narrator stopping the action to describe what a character looks like or is wearing or feeling or background information. Instead, it's all done by way of conversational interactions and secondhand remarks, all record, all occurring in real time, so to speak, without interrupting the narrative flow. What it comes down to is basic literary craftsmanship, which may interest me more than most folk, but that's partly because that's what most authors slave over, not the over arching big ideas or themes of a novel or intellectual subtext, but the nuts and bolts of creative writing, such as characterization, style, rhythm, diction, and plotting. In fact, we have several eminent fiction writers in our audience here, and I think they'll back me up on this. Here's an anecdote. Uh, Gaddis had just finished writing Carpenter's Gothic when he invited me out to his place in the Hamptons for a three-day recuperation visit in August 1984, after I'd moved from Denver to the East Coast. At breakfast on the second day, he handed me the manuscript of Carpenter's Gothic, and I spent the entire day holed up in my guest room, racing through it. When I finished in time for dinner, he grilled me about it, and every question he, had, he asked had to do with, an, did not, I'm sorry, um, Every question he asked had to do with character motivation and plot coherency. He didn't want to discuss the novel's themes or Buddhist implications or even symbolism, but rather whether he had sufficiently motivated, for example, Billy, Billy's decision near the end to fly to Africa, things of that sort. And I think since Gaddis spent so much time on such traditional staples as characterization, style, and word choice, I think critics should too. Okay, nine. I'd like to see a good essay on Gaddis's women in J.R., which is otherwise dominated by men and patriarchal systems. The novel includes a wide range from noble to ignoble and ends with three women in control of the previously patriarchal re regime, Amy Joubert, Stella Angel, and Booty Selk. Does Gaddis provide evidence that they will be any better than their male predecessors, re meaning more human, humane? Amy Joubert, yes. The other two, I doubt it. <laughs> Is Gaddis suggesting that the flaw of capitalism is consequently not a question of gender, but of lust for power and control? This could be expanded into a book on women in all four novels. In recognitions, women are mostly archetypes, the virgin, whore, mother, union, anima, but are more realistic in J.R. and then play larger roles in the later novels. Elizabeth Booth is the leading lady of Carpenter's Gothic, and it could be argued that Oscar's stepsister Christina is the true star of a frolic of his own. Speaking of women, mother-son relationships in the recognitions have been overlooked in favor of the more obvious father-son relationships. Beginning with Reverend Gwynne and Wyatt, Mr. Pivner and Otto, Frank Sinistera and Chabby, and how these mutate into father substitutes. After losing touch with Otto, Mr. Pivner becomes a father figure to Eddie Zefnik, as does Sinistera to Wyatt in Spain. Hovering above them is a relationship between the Heavenly Father and his son, who feels forsaken by him on the cross. These fathers are sympathetic if bumbling characters, but the mothers in the recognitions are portrayed almost uniformly in a bad light. Anselm complains about his rich mother, rails against his friend Charles' Christian science mother. Maud Monk wants, to, wants a baby so bad she steals one at es Esther's party, the same party where a little girl from downstairs keeps showing up to get more pills for her junkie mother. Stanley feels oppressed by his mother, and the, the mass he writes for her is literally the death of him. The only positive mother in the recognitions is Camilla, who is a ghost. And uh, perhaps the mother, the Virgin Mary in some of Wyatt's paintings. Um, call back to Goethe. There's an important scene in part two of Faust where, where Faust meets with a group called the Mothers, which could be tied in with this. I don't think it's coincidental that when Gaddis was writing the recognitions, there was a very popular book out called Generation of Vipers by Philip Wiley. You know, 1943, which has a notorious chapter called Momism, attacking the destructive role mothers play in American life. If Gaddis didn't read that book, he surely knew of it. And complicating all this is the fact that Gaddis grew up without a father, but had a wonderfully loving and supportive mother. So it'd be interesting to look at the, closer at the role of mothers in Gaddis's novels. This could be expanded to include the concept of family in his novels. Again, these are more themes in traditional novels than avant-garde ones, as I'm sure you're, you're noticing. Near the end of Recognitions, when Frank Sinistera, Wyatt, and the corpse, it's called Stephen at that point, and the corpse of the cross-eyed virgin are riding the train from San Zwingli to Madrid, Gaddis writes, quote, and they rode on, seated backwards, facing the place they'd come from, 
and looking in what light there was through the smoke like a weary and not quite respectable family, end quote. In JR, every family is dysfunctional, and then, of course, there's the JR family of companies, making up for young JR's own lack of a family, just a mother he rarely sees. Harking back to Gaddis's own lack of family, just a mother whom he sometimes went for long periods without seeing. Family connections and conflicts are at the heart of Carpenter's Gothic as well, between Liz and her brother, their distant offstage father, and so forth. You'll recall that at one point in that novel, McCandless corrects von Clausewitz's famous formulation, quote, it's not that war is politics carried on by other means, it's the family carried on by other means. Same in a frolic of his own, the complicated relationships between Judge Kreese and Oscar, between him and his stepsister, and so forth, are as important as the legal shenanigans going on around them. In his letters from Spain, his early letters from Spain, Gaddis often comments on the importance of families in Mediterranean culture. Everything is family-oriented, unlike in the U.S., which is more individual-oriented, as he shows with tragic results. And in his later letters, Gaddis seems determined not to make the same mistake as the fathers in his novels, and we see him showering his two kids with affection, encouragement, and support. Okay, now the third part, archival matters. Gaddis scholars are fortunate in having such a rich archive of materials available to us here in the Olin Library. And lucky that Gaddis was such a pack rat, he never threw away anything. Um, Ali Chatwin has already demonstrated what can be done with the materials in Gaddis' corporate writings, and there's much more waiting that can be turned to profitable uses. Number 12, for example. In 1983, I told Gaddis that I wanted to follow up my reader's guide with a manuscript study of the recognitions, which he dissuaded me from doing, and rightly so. Now that I know how much material is available, I was in no position to deal with all that back then, and even now I think I'd be overwhelmed. Now, um, so, but, but given the availability of that material here, manuscript studies of all the novels would be invaluable, especially since every one of them went, underwent radical changes between the conception and completion. Um, having said that, I, I want to acknowledge that Gaddis didn't approve of such studies. He felt that the final published versions of his books are the only ones that matter. And in a 1993 letter, he praises Oliver Wendell Holmes for, for quote, ordering all his papers burnt and letting his opinions stand for themselves. Nobody's business how he got there, end quote. But the results of such studies should be a greater appreciation of the craftsmanship that went into novels. That's, I keep coming back to that, because I think word choice, craftsmanship, that's what novelists spent most their, sweat most of their time over. There are two manuscript studies that would be particularly interesting. The earliest version of what later became the recognitions was called blog, a French word for a joke or a farce. The surviving outlines and manuscript pages indicate this was a very strange, bizarre novel. Some of it was carried over into the published novel, but that, it is so radically different that I'd love to read an analysis of it and perhaps even see it published if enough of the original manuscript survives. The other manuscript study needed is on Carpenter's Gothic. As you know, there are numerous references in the novel to Jane Eyre, both the novel and the 1943 film version. However, all those references were a last-minute substitution for Lost Horizon, both the James Hilton novel and the 1937 film. As the book was being typeset, Gaddis's publisher contacted the Hilton estate to request permission to quote from the novel, which was denied because of the erotic context in which a few of the lines appeared. Gaddis had to scramble and find a public domain work that he could use instead. And I mean scramble, this is like two, three weeks, right before the book was supposed to be sent out for review. Um, and after deciding on Car Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, he had to replace all the Lost Horizon references with lines from the book and the film version of Jane Eyre. It worked pretty well and certainly heightens the gothic element in the novel, but Gaddis later said he, said he thought that Lost Horizon material worked better. He did retain one quotation from the Hilton novel and several references to Buddhism, which was the subject of an essay Robert Cohn of this fair city wrote years ago. But since Lost Horizon was on Gaddis's mind all through the time he was working on the novel, someone should read the original manuscripts to see how it compares with the public version. Actually, that's the version I read, but I was speed reading it so quickly I don't recall that aspect of it. Also, I think an argument could be made for publishing Gaddis' original version, for I assume the current Hilton estate is run by people more worldly and sophisticated than the fuddy-duddies in charge back in 1985. And if that comes to pass, the publisher should certainly use the cover art Gaddis originally intended, a kitschy religious painting by Charles Anderson entitled The Rapture, for which permission was likewise denied. <laughs> 
Um, next, my edition of Gaddis's letters, even the new expanded version, includes only a percentage of those available here at Olin, many of which I left out for lack of room rather than for the significance. And there are many more letters in other libraries, not to mention ones in private hands that occasionally come on the used book market. Perhaps a second volume could be published someday. And speaking of letters and books, I'm surprised I haven't seen more engagement with them. You probably already noticed how many times I've been quoting from the letters. As, uh, uh, for example, random example. In fact, I put this letter in the little booklet that's available. In a 1955 letter to J. Robert Oppenheimer about a talk the scientists had given, Gaddis writes, quote, I was so stricken by the succinctness and the use of the language with which you stated the problem which has taken me seven years to assemble in almost a thousand years to present, a thousand pages to present. Well, someone should read Oppenheimer's article to see what Gaddis may have meant by those problems he was dealing with in his first novel. I'll confess I haven't yet. And finally, the archives could lead to a fuller, more detailed biography. Joseph Tabby deliberately wanted to keep his short, but there's enough material here for one of those 700-page doorstoppers. Perhaps it would appeal only to a very small audience, as Gaddis metafictionally wrote about the potential readership for his first novel, but it would still be worth doing. Okay, that's all the stuff I'd like to see. Here's new directions to be avoided. Again, strictly personal. Don't take any of this too seriously. Don't be insulted if you're working on something like this. Um, I get emails from time to time, especially students who want to explore aspects of Gaddis's work that I regard as a waste of time, barking up the wrong tree. For example, a little over a year ago, I received an email from a woman who wanted to explore the alignment of the 22 chapters of the recognitions with the 22 cards in a tarot deck, once suggested by a critic named Grace Eckley in one of the earliest critical essays on Gaddis. I responded by telling her that it was a meaningless coincidence, not worth pursuing. I explained that the recognitions had more chapters when submitted for publication and, and numbered differently, and that the present 22 came about after two chapters had been combined into one, and a few more structural changes had been made. Plus, I've come across zero references to the Tarot in any of Gaddis's writings, letters, so the parallel is just one of many coincidences that Gaddis enjoyed hearing about. Of course, some authors have indeed used the Tarot deck as a structuring device. Most famously, Thomas Pynchon in Gravity's Rainbow, less famously, Gilbert Sorrentino in Crystal Vision, and Milorad Pavic in The Last Love of Constantinople. But Gaddis isn't one of them. I gave the woman some suggestions about other occult topics in the novel that would be worth exploring, but she did not honor me with a response. In contrast, last December I received an email from a grad student in the Czech Republic who was contemplating a thesis on Gaddis and Plato and wanted some advice. I was happy to make suggestions, noting the numerous references to the Greek philosopher in his works and letters. This gentleman had the manners to thank me. I mentioned these two contrasting approaches to underline my preference for criticism that is suggested by the texts themselves, rather than critiques that impose notions from outside the text, or that belabor coincidental parallels that are ultimately nothing more than that. Take care not to chase down any old rabbit hole. And now, as I admitted earlier, my suggestions are, I, no, I'm sorry. Now, as I admitted earlier, my suggestions are somewhat old-fashioned, at odds with theory-driven criticism, especially with critics hell-bent on exposing an author's shortcomings, unconscious biases, privileged position, and or deviations from the increasingly stringent political correctness. For example, I don't agree with those critics who insist a work of art should be, in the words of Jessica Swoboda, a, quote, political project that is responsible for the advancement of feminism, anti-capitalism, post-humanism, post-colonialism, and critical race studies, end quote. No, literature is an art project not a political project. It should be judged solely on its artistic merit, not for its usefulness in pursuing social justice. Last year, a Jane Austen specialist wondered about teaching older novels that, quote, fail to speak to pressing societal issues. Perhaps a world in grave crisis truly doesn't have time for texts from the past which can't be instrumentalized by the future. No concern for artistry, craftsmanship, style, tone, wit, only whether a novel qualifies as a tool for social activism. A side note, Gaddis's novels could be used for that purpose, but just as it could be used as a prop up a wobbly table, but it's, it's not the best use for them, or the only valid one. Vladimir Nabokov once told an interviewer, quote, what makes a work of fiction safe from the larvae and rust is not its social importance, but its art, 
only its art. And I certainly want, would want to see the blinkered results of some inquisitorial critic examining his work, Gaddis's work, for racism, homophobia, misogyny, elitism, white privilege, and so on, with the invariable call for his cancellation, and perhaps that of his admirers as well. If you want to pursue those sort of critiques, you're on your own. I don't want to hear about them. I'd advise a different, more empathetic approach. In 1967, Charles Dickens wrote a sympathetic American visitor, I see you understand me, exclamation point. And that is more precious to the author than fame or gold. In many of his letters, Gaddis complains about being misunderstood, misinterpreted, and often quotes that line from Elias Prufrock that goes, quote, that is not what I meant at all, end quote. I've always felt that before you begin to interpret an author by your own lights, you should first make sure that you understand what the author felt he or she was doing. Now, you don't want to stop there, because that, that would be to succumb to what used to be called the intentional fallacy. But it should be your first step. To fully, thoroughly understand William Gaddis and his multitudinous work remains a challenge, and the scholarship that brings us closer to that goal is the kind I hope future critics will pursue. Thank you. <laughs>